All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm Michael Farrell, um, Associate Director here at Monash Biomedical Imaging, and um, I'm delighted to see all your faces here. We're in for a real treat, a real treat today, because um, we have uh, Alex Finito speaking to us. And uh, um, Alex uh, uh, received his PhD back in 2007 and, uh, and a degree in uh, clinical neuropsychology from the University of Melbourne and then um, uh, went on to learn the trade uh, at the University of Cambridge uh, before returning back to Melbourne. And um, uh, he's now the head of brain mapping and, and um, modelling theme at the Turner Institute of Brain and Mental Health, uh, based here, here at MBI. And uh, he's co-director of the Brain, Mind and Society Research Hub. Um, uh, Alex has... Um, had a very substantial impact on our thinking about the connectivity of the brain. Uh, he's published widely in extremely prestigious journals and is very frequently cited. Um, uh, the major funders in this country have recognised uh, uh, his, his value. He's re received fellowships from the NHMRC, from the ARC. And currently, he receives the very prestigious uh, Sylvia and Charles Virtual Senior Medical uh, Fellowship. And so it's with great delight that I now invite Alex uh, to the podium to speak to us about Brain Network Hubs. Thanks very much, Michael. Very kind introduction. I look forward to falling short of your expectations. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about the work that we've been doing. I mean, most of the work that we do tries to think about the brain as a network and uh, we can take different angles on that and today I'm going to talk about the work we've been doing trying to understand one specific aspect of the brain and that's the fact that it has hubs. Uh, hubs being what we consider to be parts of the brain that have more connections to other areas than um, some other parts of the brain. So <clears throat> one of the motivating drivers between this kind of work in general is really trying to understand organisational principles of the brain. And so. If you think about just some basic facts, the brain comprises about 86 billion neurons and they're connected by trillions of synapses, over 150,000 kilometres of axons, all contained within our skulls. And even though the brain comprises about 2% of body weight, it consumes about 20% of our uh, daily energy intake. <clears throat> can, can everyone hear me okay? I feel um, and so from these numbers, you can conclude two things. Uh, one is that the brain is very energy hungry, right? so it uses a lot of metabolic resources. And the other is that connectivity is important. There are lots of connections in the brain. Now, we know that these connections are not formed at random. There's been a number of studies showing that. So then that raises the question, well, what drives how these connections are formed? What causes one neuron to connect to, a, to, an, to another? And, you know, this kind of idea of what are the underlying organisational principles of the brain, it's been sort of kicked around for a while, but not really, uh, you know, no one's ever really been able to get a, a good handle on it, uh, except for maybe this man here, Santiago Romani Cajal, widely considered to be the kind of founding father of modern neuroscience. And he spent countless hours looking at nervous tissue through microscopes and his conclusion from all of his observations were that all of the various conformations of the neuron and its various components are simply morphological adaptations governed by laws of conservation of time, space and material. So by conservation of uh, space and material, he's really saying that you know, the, bri the brain tries to minimise the amount of tissue that it requires the amount of cellular material because that all consumes energy and as we've seen the brain is energy energetically hungry and in terms of conservation of time the idea is that it tries to minimize the amount of time it gets it takes to send signals through the network and so if we kind of try to frame these ideas in the context of modern network science we can think well what would a network look like if it was trying to conserve these different properties and if we wanted to generate a network that uh, maximally conserved material, so space material, we'd end up with something that looked like this. <clears throat> something that looked like, looks like this. <laughs> something that looks like 
There we go. This. Uh, oh, sorry. So each part of the brain would only connect to the areas that it's close to, and there'd be no long-range connections. Now that's fine, all your connections are short range, so you do a good job of conserving material, but if you want to send a message from, say, the back of the brain to the front of the brain, it's not very efficient. You've got to go through all of these intermediary hops to do so. So it's not really conserving time. And on the flip side, if we want to conserve time, it can be shown mathematically that if you just connect the network up at random, you do a pretty good job. Uh, and so here, in this case, you can see you've got all of these connections that cut across the network, and so you can get from one point to any other within just a couple of hops. So this kind of configuration conserves time, but doesn't really conserve material, because now you're starting to see these really long-range projections emerge. So the overall wiring cost of the network, the total volume of wiring in the network, is going to be higher. So we're kind of faced with a bit of a trade-off. On the one hand, we... Uh, want to conserve material, but we can't do that while conserving time. On the other hand, we can conserve time, but we can't conserve material. <clears throat> now, the brain is somewhere in between these two extremes. Uh, it has what we call a, a small world organization, but basically the idea is it has lots of short-range connections, but a few long-range projections that act as shortcuts that allow you to kind of send signals through the network uh, relatively efficiently. And so this is what we call network economy or economical organization, the idea being not economical in the sense of I'm going to get a cheap airfare, but uh, in the sense that you're getting the most for your given amount of uh, metabolic expenditure. So a question then is well, how, how does this kind of economical uh, organization arise? <clears throat> And so this has been the subject of lots of studies that have tried to map different aspects of brain networks. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, first up. Now, the critical concept to understand here is uh, that of a connectome. And so this was a term that was coined in 2005 by Olaf Spawns and colleagues. And they defined it as a comprehensive structural description of the network of elements and connections forming the human brain. So essentially, a wiring diagram of the brain. And we can define this at different scales. We could uh, map it at the level of each and every neuron and synapse at the micro scale. Or we could look at how populations of neurons are connected to each other by their axons at a mesoscale. Or at the macro scales that we typically deal with when we're looking in human brains, uh, we can look at how large brain areas are connected by uh, bundles of axons. <clears throat> Regardless of the scale, there's a pretty well-established pipeline for uh, generating a connectome or a network model of the connectome. So the basic idea is that we parcelate the brain into different areas, and these act as our network nodes. And then for every pair of areas, we measure some aspect of structural connectivity or functional connectivity. So functional connectivity just being some measure of how tightly coupled the activity profiles of two areas are. And so we do that for every pair of regions, and we can represent that in the form of a connectivity matrix. So here, each row and column represents a different region, and each element tells you the type and strength of connection between every pair of areas. And from that, we can generate a graph-based representation of the network, and here we draw a line or an edge between two nodes if they're connected in some way. <clears throat> From this, we can then do two broad classes of analyses. There's uh, connectivity analyses, so we can look at variations in the type and strength of connection for every pair of nodes. Or we can look at different aspects of network topology. And so uh, when we're thinking about topology, this is really trying to understand how the network is organized. So how are connections arranged with respect to each other? And there's a lot of uh, mathematical tools that we can use from the area of uh, graph theory which is uh, an area of mathematics that's been around for a very long time, uh, that allows us to quantify different aspects of how this network is organized. <clears throat> now, there's been a lot of work that's gone into trying to say, well, what are the key organizational principles or topological properties of brain networks? And I'm going to uh, coarsely summarize that in a single slide. But the basic idea is that the brain can be subdivided into subsets of nodes called modules. And so they're represented by different colors here. And so they're dens densely interconnected subsets of nodes. And the idea is that they serve some kind of common function. So you could think of them as being uh, different functional systems in the brain, say the visual system, the auditory system, and so on. Now, each of these modules has one or more hubs, shown in dark purple. 
Uh, and these hubs are also strongly interconnected with each other. So they form almost like their own module that sits on top of the others or overlaps with the others. And this kind of module of, of hubs is what we call a rich club. The idea being that the hubs are rich in terms of the numbers of connections they have, and they're a club because they're strongly interconnected with each other, more so than you would expect by chance. Now from this, you can sort of see that with modular organisation, you've got these densely clustered uh, subsets of nodes here. This supports functional specialisation, and most nodes within the same module are located near, near each other in space. So this arrangement conserves material because then you can just have lots of dense short-range connectivity. Whereas this uh, kind of rich club supports integration across the network and it conserves time. So if I want to send a message from you know, this green module to this uh, turquoise module, I just go through this kind of information superhighway of rich club connectivity to do so and that allows me to get anywhere through the network uh, relatively efficiently. Now, it turns out that this, you know, there's an underlying structure that supports this, but then the way in which brain dynamics uh, kind of negotiate this uh, balance between segregation and integration is quite dynamic. In our own work, we've looked at it in the context of uh, two large scale and, and well characterized networks. So, one shown in the middle here is the default mode network, shown in blue. Uh, so this is a network that typically shows reduced activity when people perform difficult tasks uh, and it's thought to be related to introspective processing. And the other, shown in orange, is variably called the front operator system, the executive control system, and it typically shows increased activation during difficult tasks. And so it's long been thought that these two have got a kind of antagonistic relationship. And if you look at their dynamics, when people just lie quietly in the scanner without doing anything, you can see that their activity is quite strongly negatively correlated. Uh, but this does vary across different tasks. So we found that uh, when you get people to perform challenging cognitive tasks, like a cognitive control task, greater segregation between these systems is associated with better performance. Whereas if you get them to perform a memory task that requires attending to both the internal and external world, then greater integration between these systems supports better performance. So the brain's kind of uh, juggling between these two and in a context-dependent way to support optimum behaviour. And if you look at REST, so you put people in the scanner, they don't perform a task, and you look at how these networks evolve over time. So you do a sliding window analysis, so you map a network at a given time and then another given time and another given time, and you look at how the network changes, it seems that the brain uh, spontaneously alternates between periods of high integration and low integration. So here we've plotted, uh, this is work led by Andrew Zaleski, where we plot the, how integrated each brain region is with the rest of the uh, brain. And so red is high integration, yellow is low. And you can see you get these states where almost the entire brain goes red, followed by periods where almost the entire brain goes yellow. So corresponding to high integration and low integration states. And so we suspect that it's these high integration states that allow the brain to explore alternative network configurations that might uh, deviate to some extent from the underlying anatomy and provides a bit of a basis for, for flexibility in different circumstances. <clears throat> now the interesting thing is that these kind of high integration states are likely facilitated by shifts uh, in the connectivity between hubs. So if you look at the connections that show the most variable connectivity over time, it tends to be the long-range connections between the modules, so these kind of uh, rich club links. And this is uh, something that's quite interesting. So not only does it kind of confirm our intuitions that connections between hubs and rich links are important for integrated brain function, but <clears throat> Uh, it's on the flip side, kind of going back to Cajal's idea and this trade-off of, of cost and value, although these connections support high integration, they also come at quite a high cost because these connections are linking up different parts of the brain, so their axons are extending over much longer anatomical distances. So they uh, incur a, hiring, a higher wiring cost. This was something that was shown quite nicely by uh, Martin Vanden Heuvel and Olaf Sporns and colleagues. So you can imagine there's this sort of schematic here, which is similar to the one I showed earlier, where you've got these hubs in red and not hubs in gray. <clears throat> and so you've got this rich club of connected hubs with their links in red. And then you've got, you got what we call feeder connections, which is a connection between a non-hub and a hub, and then uh, a, a local or peripheral connection, which is a link between two non-hubs. 
And so the basic idea is that you know, if you want to get from any point in the brain, you would sort of start out here in the periphery, hop onto a feeder, get into the rich club, then go out to where you've got to go. So we can map these connections uh, and where they are in the brain, and you end up with something like this, and then we can say, well, what's the average distance of these connections? How costly are they? And if you bin them by short range, middle range, and long range, most of the long range connections are the rich links, these, these connections between the hubs. Right? Uh, and if you look at you know, what you might think could be communication paths in the brain, so these kind of shortest paths between nodes, the, uh, the rich links account for the majority of the cost of those potential communication paths. So this is just confirming that these connections between hubs are relatively costly in terms of the overall wiring of uh, volume of wiring that they uh, that they occupy. We can also do it in a bit more of a quantitative way, where we use metabolic imaging. So this time, we uh, measure levels of glucose metabolism at rest. This is work from Marcus Reichel's team. And so up the top is uh, a map of areas showing high levels of glucose metabolism at rest. And you can see that it, overla it overlaps quite well with areas of the default mode and, and cognitive control systems. So these are generally areas of association cortex and paralimbic cortex. And these are what we know to be the major hubs of the brain. So at rest, not only do the hubs have long range connections, which are quite costly, but they also consume higher levels of glucose metabolism. <clears throat> So, all well and good, hub connections are functionally valuable, they support integrated brain function, comes at some cost, they're metabolically costly, they uh, take a lot of, uh, they occupy a large fraction of the brain's total wiring cost. Now, it also turns out that this high cost might render these areas vulnerable to the effects of disease. So, if you map amyloid burden in people with Alzheimer's disease, you can see quite a striking spatial correspondence with the areas that show high levels of metabolism. And in a recent meta-analysis from Ed Bullmore's team where they looked at 26 different brain disorders, for each disorder they looked at areas where there's reduced grey matter volume and they found that across most of these disorders these grey matter volume reductions were more likely to occur in the hubs of the brain. And that's regardless of the underlying pathology. So you've got disorders as diverse as Alzheimer's, Asperger's, Huntington's, depression, schizophrenia, epilepsy. They all show this tendency. So regardless of the underlying pathological mechanism, uh, pathology tends to accumulate in the hubs of the brain. And there are lots of potential reasons as to why that might occur. Uh, we don't, that's not so important for today, but the, the point is that, uh, the, you know, the, the three take home messages are that Hubs are functionally valuable, they support integrated function, they're also costly, both in terms of wiring cost and metabolic cost, and this high cost might render them to, uh, susceptible to the effects of uh, quite diverse diseases. <clears throat> so, that's maps. The next question is, okay, we can map where things are in the brain, but can we develop uh, models that might give us some insight into how hubs emerge and what drives their formation um, where they are in the brain, why they're such, what, you know, what, why are they designated as hubs at all? And so to this we can turn to, to mathematical models. And the basic idea behind this kind of approach is that you try to grow a network in a computer according to specific wiring rules and you then look at the network that you grow and you look at its properties and you say, does this network look like a brain in terms of its topology? And so you can specify different rules for connecting different uh, pairs of nodes. So the simplest is to just connect things at random. Uh, and this is kind of a baseline for all these models. Generally, they're connecting, making connections at random subject to some constraints. So this has been done a little bit in the field. And kind of the, the model that seems to do best uh, is this, has this kind of general form. And it's called a, a trade-off model. And so the basic idea is that the probability of connecting any two nodes, U and V, is proportional to the distance between them uh, raised to some negative power eta. So the idea is that you're penalizing long-range connections, so there's some distance penalty where you're less likely to form long-range connections between areas. 
multiplied by some topology term. And the idea here is that you might penalize or uh, reduce the probability of forming a long-range connection, but if that connection provides some kind of advantage or value in terms of topology, then you want to counteract that and say, well, this is a valuable connection, I want to keep that. And so this weighting here, gamma, determines how you weight that. So it's this trade-off between cost and value, right, which is kind of, uh, it tries to mathematically formalize this idea implicit in Cajal's original statement that there's this kind of trade-off between cost and value that drives brain network wiring. Now, the question is, how do you define value? What, what should be uh, substituted for T here? Now, lots of different things have been tried. Uh, here's a couple of different examples. The details are not so important. But when you compare them, so you, you know, generate models according to these different rules, and you see, well, which one is the closest to the brain? It turns out that there's one that uh, seems to win pretty consistently. And so that's substituting T for this property here called the matching index. And this is just uh, the number of uh, uh, neighbors that two nodes have in common. So the idea is if two nodes are connected to other similar nodes, they're going to be more likely to form a connection to each other. Right? So on the one hand in the model, I've got this penalty on forming long-range connections, but if two nodes connect to other similar nodes, I'm going to have a bias to form a connection between those two nodes. And so in a very loose sense, you could think of this as mimicking a Hebbian plasticity rule, the idea being if two nodes connect to other similar areas, they're likely to have similar dynamics and so are more likely to, to form a connection to each other. And so this is just a, an example of the model comparison here. You've got a measure of how good the model fit is, so lower is better. And so this is this kind of matching model, and then you've got uh, the others out here. And this is just one based purely on space. So that's kind of doing the worst. <clears throat> now this is an example of what we mean by how well does it fit the brain. So for the brain, you can compute all these different properties. So here is the degree distribution. So this is the distribution of connections across nodes. Here is the clustering distribution. So it's another property that just defines how locally clustered a node's connectivity is. Here is the betweenness distribution. So again, just a measure of how uh, important a, a node is in the brain. And this is the, the distribution of connection distances. And so the, the solid lines are the brain, and the light lines are different runs of the model. And you can see it's doing a pretty good job. Right. So it seems to be capturing these aggregate statistical properties of the brain, these broad distributional properties of, of major uh, factors of topology. So you'd think, okay, wow, you know, I can capture all of this complexity in the brain using this really simple two-parameter model, uh, uh, implying that connections are formed at random, subject to some very basic constraints, and that gives me a brain network. But it's a little bit more subtle than that. Uh, and a key factor is, although you're capturing kind of the distributions of properties across the brain, this doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting the same type of spatial topography, so where things are actually located in the brain. So just to illustrate that, here we've got a map of the hubs in the brain. So here each node is scaled according to the number of connections it has. This is the data. You can see they're distributed throughout the brain. And then here, these are the hubs in our model, one of our model networks. You can see they're all clustered up here in the parietal lobe, which is actually an area of low connectivity in the data. So if you plot the two together, there's actually a bit of a negative correlation. So although these models are capturing the kind of general statistical properties of the brain, they're not actually doing a very good job of capturing where things are in the brain. And that seems to matter. Using a kind of slightly different approach, uh, James Roberts, Leo Goyo, and, and Michael Breakspear recently uh, started with their empirical connectome and then started rewiring the connections, but trying to keep the wiring cost the same. And so you can look at how network properties change as you gradually rewire more and more connections. So you can see this is the actual network. These are the connections between hubs. They're all kind of on the lateral surface. As you rewire more and more connections, you end up with a ball in the middle. And so if you look at the wiring cost of the hub connections, so remember I've been saying that the hub connections are the most costly aspects of the brain, but if you look at what happens to this wiring cost as you rewire more connections, it drops substantially. 
and that's because all the hubs kind of end up in the middle of the brain, so all the connections get quite short range. And then if you compute a measure of functional complexity, so this is just um, a measure that you can use to estimate how complex the dynamics are that can emerge from the underlying structure, it turns out that that decreases quite a lot. So even though this network here has the same topological properties, like if you look at distributions and things, it's pretty similar to the actual brain, the spatial topography, the spatial embedding is quite different and that seems to have uh, functional consequences. So where things are in the brain also matters. And in some ways this is kind of reassuring uh, potentially for people who are kind of interested in biology because although at one hand we'd like to think, oh, you know, maybe random processes do, uh, do describe how connections form in the brain, there is a very extensive literature in developmental biology talking about how uh, axon guidance and how neurons connect to each other is a very tightly genetically regulated process. And so that kind of creates a bit of a conflict. So how on the one hand could these models that are quite random give you something that looks like a connectome? And on the other hand, um, we have all this other evidence saying that genes play a really important role in how neurons connect with each other. So this is something that we've been kind of uh, interested in, in pursuing a bit and <clears throat> you know the initial working hypothesis was that maybe genetic influences are particularly strongly concentrated on the connections between hubs because these connections play a really important role in negotiating how the brain um, balances this trade-off between cost and value and this is something that kind of uh, came up a little while ago where well, almost yeah, almost 10 years ago now we did a small scale twin study where we uh, derived a measure that tried to capture this balance between the cost and efficiency of a brain region's connectivity and we looked at the heritability of that measure and we found that uh, the areas that showed statistically significant heritability tended to be areas of default mode and uh, frontoparietal systems, so the association areas. So implying that the kind of cost efficiency of hub connectivity is under genetic control. And so over the last few years, uh, this is work that was largely led by Ben Fulcher, who's now in Sydney, and Irina Arnat Kevichute, who's uh, upstairs at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> we've been trying to understand the molecular basis of this kind of uh, potential genetic influence on, on hub connectivity in a bit more detail. And so, in, this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. And this is really, you know, we've kind of tried to tackle this from a really uh, multi-scale perspective. So we've done analyses in connectomes mapped at each of these different scales and in each case we're trying to link it to uh, measures of molecular function. So just before I get started to make sure we're all on the same page, you know there's a pretty simplified canonical pathway that links genes to observable behavior, right? So the idea is that we have genes that code for proteins that impact the functions of cells. This in turn affects how circuits uh, activate and then larger scale system-wide activity and then ultimately that's what drives behaviour. Now if you kind of drill down into how genes actually do this, uh, you can look at different aspects of this process. So at a very basic level there's structural variation in the genome at the level of the, the letters, the nucleotides that make up our, our DNA sequence. So at any given point in the genome people might show different letters here and this can have functional consequences for the protein that uh, is then expressed from that gene. We can look at levels of gene transcription. So this is when the DNA double helix gets unwound and you get a piece of uh, RNA that comes and reads the uh, appropriate segment, uh, creates a copy and then uh, that process there is called gene transcription. And then that gets transported to the ribosome where it uh, gets translated into a protein and ultimately that protein folds into its final configuration and does what it does in the cell. So we can kind of assay different aspects of this process. So if we want to look at DNA variation, we can use twin designs to generate statistical models of how important genetic variation is in determining a trait. So the idea is that identical twins have 
more or less identical genomes, whereas non-identical twins share an average 50 percent. So if genes play an important role in regulating a trait, then it should be more similar between identical compared to non-identical twins. And there are various elaborate statistical models you can use to actually uh, assign a number to the proportion of variance in a trait that can be explained by genes. So that will uh, give you a quantitative estimate of how important genes are, but it won't tell you which specific genes are important. You can then actually more directly look at structural variation in the, in, in, in the genome. So you can genotype people, look at where they vary, and see how those variations correlate with a given trait. This is done most comprehensively in the context of a genome-wide association study where you do that for about a million points throughout the genome, and you just see how all of those different variations correlate with a given trait. But because you've got a million comparisons, you need very large samples to do that confidently. Uh, and so that will identify variants in a statistical sense, but sometimes those variants are not exactly located in the causal uh, gene. They might just be tagging somewhere uh, in the vicinity that is actually the, the, the causal genetic mechanism for a trait. So you could kind of more directly get to uh, causal mechanisms by looking at patterns of gene transcription. So this is where we quantify messenger RNA, which is what reads the unwound uh, DNA segment. So you can quantify how much of that is in the cell as a marker of how much that gene is being read. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we're interested in protein abundance because that's what is influencing the function of the cell. And so you can look at that with proteomics, but that's something that's quite hard to scale at the level of the entire genome or across lots of different tissue samples. Uh, so in a sense, proteomic studies are the most proximal to mechanisms, but uh, most studies look at uh, gene transcription because these are much easier to scale on a genome-wide level. And so what I'm going to talk about today is, is a combination of, of studies looking at uh, structural variation and uh, gene transcription. No, sorry, not structural variation, uh, twin studies and gene transcription. So the first work that we did in this space was in the mouse and we took advantage of data made openly available by the Allen Brain Institute. A few years ago, they published a draft of the mouse connectome mapped through a large number of track tracing experiments. So these are, so essentially what they do is they inject a viral tracer into a part of the mouse brain, and then after a couple of weeks, that tracer gets taken up by the areas that are connected to the injection site, and so then you can image that uptake and work out where the axons go. So they did over 400 injections. These are the injection sites in the right hemisphere of the brain, and this is what the uptake images look like. So you can stitch all that data together and generate a connectivity matrix, and that's your connectome. And so we've got full here, here we've got full connectivity between right hemisphere regions and all the outgoing projections going from right to left. But what I'm going to talk about today, we've focused just on the right hemisphere because that's where we had complete coverage. So in the first instance, we just wanted to say, okay, well, does this connectome show a rich club? Does it show all the properties that we want to see? And so I'm going to kind of labor this kind of plot a little bit because you're going to see a lot of it. And so what I've got here is the degree distribution of the mouse brain. So degree is the number of connections that are attached to a given node. And so this is the distribution of that value across all nodes. So you can see that it's got a long tail here. So this is consistent with the idea that we've got hubs in the network. These are nodes that have got uh, an unusually large number of connections. And in the first instance, we want to say, well, does the network show evidence of rich club organization? So are these hubs more strongly interconnected with each other than you expect by chance? And so this is quantified using this value here. It's called the rich club coefficient. And it's basically just uh, the idea is you divide the network in half. You, well, not in half. You divide the network into two. You say, OK, these nodes are hubs. These nodes are non-hubs. And then you look at the hubs and you say, what's the number of connections between the hubs, which is the numerator, divided by the total possible number of connections. So it's essentially a measure of how densely connected are the hubs in the brain. But the critical question is, how do you define hubs or non-hubs? Right? I could say, OK, I'm going to cut this distribution here. And all these guys are hubs and these guys are non-hubs. Or maybe I should cut it here. Or maybe I should cut it here. So what we do is we look at this value across all possible thresholds. So we start at a very low threshold. We say, okay, everything 
uh, above this level of connectivity is a hub, so all these nodes are hubs, these are non-hubs, and then we move across and we plot this value uh, at each threshold. And we normalize it by what we expect in a randomized network. So this just establishes what we expect by chance. And so if we get a value greater than one, then we're seeing stronger connectivity between hubs than we expect by chance. So you can see here, as we move along, uh, you see that the coefficient's rising, then we get a sharp rise here once we get to about 42 connections per node. And so this grey shaded area here is what we call the topological rich club regime. It's where we see statistically significant evidence for rich club organisation in the network. Here we've just plotted where these nodes are. So the colours represent different anatomical divisions, cortex, thalamus, cerebellum and so on. And the area is proportional to the number of nodes in that division. And I mean the main point here is that the hubs are found right throughout the brain. They're not specific to any part of the brain. And here we've got three different measures of connection costs. So we've got the average distance of connections between hubs, the average connection weight, proportional to the number of axons connecting two areas, and the probability of finding a reciprocal connection between hubs. And so in all cases, you can see that this increases as we move along and get more and more stringent in terms of what we're calling hubs. So when we're in the tail of the distribution here, We've got quite high values. And so this is just confirming that these connections between hubs are indeed the most costly in the network. And then here we've got two measures of centrality. So these are just different measures of how important connections are for, for brain function. Uh, they just make different assumptions about what important might mean. But in both cases, uh, they increase as a function of our degree threshold. Uh, so, uh, again, just confirming that not only are the connections between hubs most costly, but they're also quite functionally valuable. So that's all well and good. There's nothing new there. That's been shown in a lot of different species. We just wanted to confirm that's what happens in the mouse. Then the next question is, well, how can we relate this to genetics? And the nice thing about the Allen data is that we have measures of gene expression in over 17,500 genes for each of our brain regions. So on the one hand, we've got our connectome for 213 regions. On the other hand, we've got our gene expression matrix. So the regions are on the rows and genes are on the columns. And we returned to that initial kind of uh, framework for thinking about the brain, where we divide our network into hubs in orange, non-hubs in blue. Then you get three different types of connections. You can get a rich link between two hubs, a feeder link between a hub and a non-hub, and a peripheral link between two non-hubs. And then you can go for any pair of regions, you can go and pull out their corresponding expression profiles and then correlate those. So for every pair of nodes, we've got the type of connection they're linked by and also how tightly coupled their pattern of gene expression is. And then we can just say, well, does this gene expression coupling vary as a function of the link class, as a function of rich feed or peripheral? So this is what uh, I've shown here. So on the Y is the average uh, level of gene expression correlation for rich links, feed and peripheral, uh, moving across our hub threshold. And so you can see across most thresholds, it's highest for rich links, intermediate for feeder and lowest for peripheral. Right? So suggesting that uh, pairs of connected hubs have got the highest levels of coupled gene expression. This just shows uh, where those findings are in the brain. So here each point along the circle is a different node and we've got different divisions here, cortex, olfactory areas, hippocampus and so on. The lines are anatomical connections and the colour represents how strongly coupled gene expression was. And they're ordered so the hubs are always kind of uh, to the moving clockwise and they're in red. And so most of the orange and red links are between the hubs in the different divisions. It's not contained within any single division. So, because what we're interested in, we're, so we're asking the question, does uh, this property change for connected hubs compared to other types of areas? Now, how you define hubs is arbitrary. Uh, so, you know, you could say, I'll take nodes with more than 100 connections as hubs or more than 80 connections in hubs. So what we do is we just compute this across all possible thresholds, and that's what the x-axis is. So if an effect is truly present for the hubs, 
you'd expect it to increase as you get more stringent because that's where you're actually getting to the hubs of the network. Right? So you can see we're in the tail of this distribution here. And so they're the actual hubs. Like if it happened out here, they're not really the hubs because they've got low levels of connectivity. Does that make sense? So more towards the right there, that's a, a node that has 70 connections. Yeah, so once you're out here, all nodes have got 50 or more connections. Right. And it's those hubs or nodes with heaps of connections that have higher correlations between two yeah, so there's this tendency, because it keeps going up, there's this tendency for the strength of gene expression coupling to increase as you've got more highly connected nodes. Um, so it's a very global picture. So we're looking at expression values across 17,500 genes and we're summarising that with a single correlation value. So we want to ask, well, do some sets of genes make a stronger contribution to this effect than others? And so here we can do what's called an enrichment analysis. And so in this case, we make use of bioinformatic databases where people have annotated genes to specific categories based on the functions they serve in a cell. Uh, and so then you can look at groups of genes. And so you do these statistical enrichment tests where you say, OK, well, all of these genes have been assigned to category X is the mean value in this category higher than you would expect by chance? And that gives you evidence of enrichment for a particular functional category of genes. And these categories most commonly are, are, are defined using what's called a gene ontology. So we do this and we find evidence for significant enrichment uh, for these five categories here that are all related to the synthesis and breakdown of ATP. So ATP being the primary energetic substrate of brain activity. What we're seeing here is in this very data-driven way where we've thrown everything in, we're kind of pulling back or, or returning this molecular signature of hub connectivity that's related to the high metabolic demands of these areas. And if you look just at the level of correlated gene expression within these categories, you can see it's a pretty impressive and specific marker of this kind of topological rich club regime. It's also important to point out that this trend counters what we generally see in the brain. So if we just look at the brain, regardless of hub status, we look at all connections, we find that the probability of any two areas being connected decays sharply as a function of distance. And same for correlated gene expression, right? So if two areas are separated by long anatomical distances, they're likely to have low levels of gene expression correlation. Whereas we find that hubs, on average, are separated by longer distances, they're more likely to be connected, and they've got the highest levels of gene expression coupling. So suggesting that there is something transcriptionally distinct about, about hub regions. And again, if we look at the enrichment signature, just comparing connected versus unconnected nodes, regardless of hub status, so here we're just trying to work out which genes are involved in forming a connection. We see enrichment of all these categories and lots of things you'd expect, so regulation of synaptic plasticity, uh, neuron to neuron synaptic transmission, axon elongation, and so on. So it suggests that while these categories important, uh, while these genes are important in forming a connection, the main uh, transcriptional distinction between different uh, topological categories of connections, as defined by hub status, is really driven by the metabolic demands of the areas that they're connecting. So that was that was kind of quite interesting. It theoretically aligns with what we would think about hubs and their high cost and so on. But we wanted to see, well, you know, can we replicate this in a different context? And so for that, we turned to uh, the nematode worm C. elegans. This is a famous animal in connectomics. It was the first animal to have had its nervous system mapped completely at the level of each and every neuron and synapse as a very stereotypical organization. So 302 neurons and about 6,000 synapses. And there is also some gene expression data in the worm. So in this case, it's not as complete as for the mouse. We're looking at the curation of published reports in the literature. And uh, each, it's binary. So we only know if a gene was expressed in a neuron or not, but not to what degree it was expressed. But it's enough to make a start. And we also have a lot of other information about the neurons that then allows us to drill into, well, what might be driving uh, any gene expression differences. 
This is just a map of the worm showing where the hubs are. All the hubs are located in the head and the tail. So you've got these long range connections here that extend across the body of the worm. So once again, we see that the hub connections are the costliest aspects of the network. And if we repeat our uh, gene expression analysis, we find evidence for a similar pattern. Correlated gene expression is highest for the rich links, intermediate for feeder, and lowest for peripheral. So then we can dig deeper. We can use all this information about the neurons and say, well, what might be driving this effect? As I mentioned, all the neurons, all the hubs are in the head and the tail, so maybe it's driven by the anatomical location. All the hubs are also interneurons, which is a specific class of neurons, so maybe it's because they're all interneurons. But you know, if you kind of do your tests, you separate the the neurons based on these categories and look at hubs and non-hubs, it doesn't seem to explain the findings, so it can't be explained by neuronal type. We then looked at modules. Uh, what happens if we assign nodes to modules? Is this effect driven by the fact that hubs tend to be just within one module of the brain? But again, if you look at connections between and within modules separated by hub versus non-hub, this can't explain it either, so it's not explained by module affiliation. Now we know from other work that hubs are all born quite early in the timeline of uh, the worm. So we've got the birth date of every neuron, and we know that all the hubs are born early before we see any evidence of movement in the animal. So maybe it's because they're all born early, and so we can look at that in terms of birth times, but we can also look at it in terms of lineage distance, which is the number of cell divisions that separates a pair of cells from a common progenitor. So we have that too for, for every pair of cells in the worm. And in either case, it doesn't seem to be related to this effect. So there's no real, really clear association between correlated gene expression and developmental proximity. So what could be explaining it? Well, it turns out that all of the hubs uh, are, as, well, most of the hubs are a specific class of interneuron called command interneurons. And if, if you separate uh, command interneurons into hubs and hub non-command interneurons, you can see quite a big difference in correlated gene expression. So it's really an effect driven by these guys. Now, command interneurons are quite interesting because they play a really important role in regulating motion in the worm. And so if you think about it, motion is the most complex behavior that a worm can engage in. So in a certain sense, there's a bit of a parallel there between what we see in the humans, where the hubs are in association cortex, which again are these areas that kind of mediate the higher order aspects of human behavior. So you know, that's kind of one interesting take on it. You know, there, is, there are kind of challenges with these data because, as I said, we're curating reports from published literature and it's potential that there's, you know, maybe there was a bias in the way these data were acquired and people tended to look at command interneurons more often as, as, a, as a single group. Um, so, you know, there is that possibility and that's kind of hard to disentangle. But, um, you know, at a certain level, there's a bit of a parallel there with what we see in humans. So. That was kind of nice to see consistent evidence across the worm and the human, different scales, very different data, very different gene expression data, very different connectivity data. So what happens if we go to humans? Can we see the same thing in humans? And we've sort of tackled this from a couple of perspectives. Uh, so in the first instance, we just wanted to look at the heritability of connectivity in the brain. Right? So this is uh, simply quantifying heritability using a twin design. With the recent availability of the Human Connectome Project, we have this data now, it's openly available. And so we just said, well, if we map the heritability of connectivity strength across all the connections in the brain, are the connections between hubs more heritable? Are they under a stronger genetic influence? This would kind of, again, speak to that issue I spoke about in the modeling, where using random models, we can't reproduce where hubs are in the brain. So perhaps hubs are under particularly strong genetic influences. So we can kind of test this using heritability analysis. And this is indeed what we find. So here I've, we've mapped the average heritability of connections, rich, feeder, and peripheral. So you can see that heritability is highest for rich links, the connections between hubs, intermediate for feeder, and lowest for peripheral. So suggesting that connections between hubs are under the strongest genetic influence across all the brains. So genetic influences are not distributed homogeneously throughout the connectome. They're particularly concentrated on the hubs. And this, again, just shows where it is in the brain. Uh, the details are not so important, but yeah, basically you see the effects throughout all the different lobes in the both hemispheres. So it's not something that's confined to a specific subset of areas. <clears throat> 
So that's, you know, some initial uh, kind of evidence from a different perspective, again, suggesting that there is something genetically special about hubs. But we can also do our gene expression analysis in the human, again, using data from the Allen Institute. They've also got a human atlas for gene expression. And so in this case, they've uh, looked at six post-mortem brains, and they've measured gene expression in thousands of different areas. These are all the different sites from which they've taken tissue samples. And for each of these samples, you've got expression measures in over 20,000 genes. So you can build this co-expression matrix here. You can map all these samples onto uh, brain regions that you would analyze in your connectome. And then you can start to relate different properties of your connectome to uh, different aspects of gene expression in different ways. This just shows different ways of doing that. The details are not so important. You know, what I'm going to present here, we've just repeated the same thing that we did with the mouse and the worm. So we focused on the left hemisphere cortex because that's where the expression atlas has the most comprehensive anatomical coverage. And we had uh, just over 10,000 genes that survived our quality control criteria. And so then if we repeat our game, we look at levels of correlated gene expression between the different link classes. Uh, we find that we can uh, replicate the mouse and worm result. So again, Correlated gene expression is highest for rich links, intermediate for feeder, and lowest for peripheral. And again, this is an effect that's found uh, right throughout uh, the brain. So across these different scales now, we're, we're seeing pretty consistent evidence for this kind of distinct gene expression signature of hub connectivity. And again, if we do our enrichment analysis, the top categories are all involved in energy metabolism. So, that's wonderful. It's all consistent. This is great. We can go home. But something a bit more troubling that we've been digging into a bit further is that um, while we have confidence in the correlated gene expression result, these uh, enrichment signatures um, might have a particular bias. And so I'm just going to touch on this and I guess end on a bit of a negative note because this is something that's occupying our minds at the moment. So we get these energy signatures. But if you look across the literature, so there's lots of studies now relating gene expression to different imaging phenotypes. And it seems like all the same categories seem to keep popping up. And they're all related to neuronal function and energy metabolism. So in a certain sense, you might expect that. But you know, there's lots of different phenotypes that are studied, very different properties. Maybe you might expect a bit more heterogeneity. So this is just an example of some of the categories that pop up a lot in the literature. Uh, and these are all the different references that have shown evidence of significant enrichment. Uh, so these are different studies using different things. Some might have looked at gray matter volume, some might have looked at functional connectivity, some at structural. So there's consistent implications of all these categories. So the question is, is it real? Or is it due to some bias in the way these enrichment analyses are being done? So to address this, um, this is again work led by Ben Fulcher we wanted to create a reference. So we get our gene expression matrix and we completely randomize it. We randomize the assignments of genes and brain areas so we end up with this kind of unstructured data set. And then we generate random brain phenotypes and we correlate those. So we generate random phenotypes across the brain, a random spatial map of just random numbers, and we correlate that with each gene separately, each gene's expression profile. Then we do an enrichment analysis and we say, well, do we get certain categories that are significantly enriched. And so that acts as our baseline of what we would expect by chance. Then we go to our actual gene expression data and we take our random brain maps and we correlate it with the actual gene expression data. And we say, okay, well, how much enrichment do we see under this condition? And so this is, uh, again, uh, this is trying to look at the bias now because these are random brain maps. So we should expect to find no enrichment. Okay, so if there's no bias, then the results we get from this analysis should be the same as what happens when we generate, when we correlate with the randomized. And then as a third level, we generate random phenotypes but with a spatial autocorrelation. So, you know, in, generally, in general, most imaging phenotypes are not completely random. They have some kind of spatial dependence. Gene expression data has a spatial dependence, so just those two facts alone will cause some level of correlation. So here we generate these uh, spatially autocorrelated random phenotypes uh, and generate it with the data. So these two analyses, two and three, are really trying to look at the bias 
So if there's no bias, we should expect no significant enrichment, uh, at least beyond what we see in this reference case one. So what happens? We compute this measure that quantifies the proportion of false positives. So under the reference case, this is our baseline, we see a very low proportion, right? Uh, less than 0.01. And this is what we see with this random case, case number two, where we just generate random numbers and correlate it with the gene expression data. And this is the case with the spatial autocorrelation. So it gets a bit worse with the spatial autocorrelation. So this is suggesting there's quite a strong bias here, right? If there was no bias, then uh, all of these distributions should be down here near the reference case, but they're not. They're elevated relative to the reference case. And in some cases, you're talking about a kind of 30%, 40% increase in your false positive rate. Even more troubling, if you bin the different gene categories by how, uh, what their false positive rate is like, because some categories are more likely to pop up as false positives than others. So as we move along the x-axis, gene categories, um, you know, these are categories that are more likely to pop up as false positives. And then we look at the proportion of uh, these categories that were found as significantly enriched in the human and mouse literature. You can see that that increases as you get to the categories that are more likely to show false positives. So, you know, the, the, essentially the reason, the reason for this, it's, you know, a bit, uh, well, it's not so technical, but, you know, it's not so important, but basically it's driven by differences in how correlated genes are within a category. So genes that are strongly correlated within a category are more likely to be enriched because they got more consistent patterns. Um, but, you know, this is kind of pointing to a bit of a fundamental bias in the way we kind of do these enrichment analyses. And this is largely because these analyses were originally developed for a very different purpose, and now they've been adapted to deal with these brain-wide gene expression atlases, which introduce new challenges. And so it just means that we need to kind of think about these issues in a little bit more detail to have confidence in uh, the gene expression signatures that we're pulling out. So, returning from that sour note, uh, and going back to Cajal's original proposal, if we kind of try and frame that in the modern network context, we see that modules uh, can serve space and material because they tend to comprise subsets of nodes that are physically located together, so there's lots of short-range connectivity. Hubs can serve time, but it comes at some cost. Right, so they support efficient communication through the network, but their connections are long range, so there's a, a wiring cost there. Now the way in which hubs are spatially located, their spatial embedding, their topography is not random. And you know, to the best of our mathematical models proposed to date, we can't reproduce the spatial location of hubs using these kind of random models. On top of that, it seems like hub connectivity in particular is under quite strong genetic control. So genetic influences are not equal across the connectome. They are strongly concentrated on the connections between hubs. Again, these are costly, valuable parts of the brain, and so genes are playing an important role in determining how strongly connected they are. And related to that, it seems like hubs have got this unique gene expression signature where they've got tightly coupled patterns of gene expression. Um, which is potentially related to the functional demands of, the, uh, of these areas, and this is something that we're kind of looking into at the moment. So thanks for your attention. I'll just close by acknowledging uh, that Arena Anatkevichute and Ben Fulcher did most of this work. The modelling work was done by Stuart Oldham, um, and a big thank you to uh, the Charles, Sylvia and Charles Viettel Foundation for funding. So thanks for your attention. Yeah, sure. Um, would anyone like to uh, pose a question to uh, Alex? Here's a hand. Hello. That was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you see any specific unique things when you compare long and short range connections with inner hub and how much you have this genetic correlations between like two nodes, whether they're short versus long, if you've looked at that. Yeah, so it seems to hold up. Uh, so if you say look at 
short, middle, long range connections and look at hubs, non hubs, it seems to be consistent across all. It gets a bit bigger with the long range, but it's consistent. Especially with the heritability as well, we see that um, where in those distance bins, it's still the connections between hubs that are. So although, although on average hub connections are longer, it's not just distance. There's something special about hubs as well. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> this might be a stupid question, so correct me if I'm wrong. I don't really know much about this kind of stuff. But before you were saying that in a whole host of sort of neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative disorders, you tend to see um, grey matter reductions in areas associated with hubs, right? And then also that, as far as we can tell so far, it appears that genes, like genetic influences on hubs are stronger than other sort of network connections in the brain. Is that also correct? So is there a logical connection there in terms of like a shared genetic vulnerability to um, neurodegenerative disorder and sort of, I, I don't know, I don't really know how to phrase this very well, I'm sorry, but would you say that um, the genes that sort of express as um, hubs are related to the genes that could cause neurodegenerative or neurodevelopmental disorder? Uh, yes, I mean, this is, you know, this would be one potential conclusion uh, to draw from this that, you know, the, the genes that influence your risk for disorder are uh, operating through their influence on hubs. Now, I suspect that might be the case for neurodevelopmental disorders. For neurodegenerative, there's other potentially environmental reasons why hubs might be more vulnerable. Um, this is something that we were, you know, trying to look at and we've kind of hit a bit of a roadblock because to do it properly, you need really large samples. Um, but it's definitely a hypothesis that I'm kind of interested in pursuing. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for a great talk. Very, very interesting. Uh, I have three questions. Um, the first one is just uh, whether you could clarify what was measured uh, in terms of complexity about those uh, random models and the fact that the complexity was basically uh, lowered uh, along randomization of connections. Maybe I, I missed that uh, during the talk. Um, the second question is about the, um, the results linked to the C. elegans work that you described, um, that apparently those common interneurons versus non-common interneurons showed uh, differences, which may mean that, is it right to say that then the Okay, the topological organization of those important nodes would be a function of the functions that are essential to a given organism to survive or to strive in uh, its environment. And if so, does it mean that it's an evolutionary process that occurred over a long, 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 long time for us as well, humans, so that those nodes are positioned in a certain way in the brain? And the third question is about the, the curves as a function of the threshold to define hubs versus non-hubs. Many of the properties that you showed keep rising, but also rise past that area when in particular you have strong uh, psi values, your criterion, except for the um, correlations in the genetics, specifically for those genes, uh, the, this subset of genes that you described. So why is this, this, is this continuous rise that continues past? Is there an interpretation for that? Sorry for too many questions. <laughs> Do my best to remember him. Uh, so, what was number one? <laughs> the complexity. Ah, so um, they looked at a couple of different ones. From memory, this one was: you've got your structural connection, a connectome. You assume a simple model of dynamics, and then you get a covariance matrix. And from that, you look at the distribution of values. And the idea is that if something is, if the distribution is flat at one end or random at the other. Uh, then that's not complex, so ideally you'd want something in the middle. So the measure's trying to capture that. 
Um, two was... God, I'm not remembering any of them. Um, yeah, so, you know, look, that's, there's, there's several potential reasons. So one is maybe it's related to the function and maybe there's something special about the elements of networks that are involved in the most complicated functions that, that you know, the organism can be involved in. That's the kind of sexy hypothesis. The boring one is that maybe there's a bias in the way the data is being curated um, that causes you to uh, be more likely to find similar gene expression patterns in that class of neurons. There's kind of arguments for and against that. Um, you know, I, again, it, it could be that, you know, so we looked at things like neurochemicals secreted, birth time and so on. None of those explained it. It could be that maybe these neurons have got a more similar morphology, maybe they've got a more similar physiology, that, you know, some, some other property that wasn't measured. Um, and again, maybe that is part of the fact that they serve a particular function. So it's hard to disentangle. The last point, why does it keep increasing? I've got one. Um, yeah, it, it, it gets tricky. Once you get right out into the tail, you've got fewer nodes, and so your statistics are bad. Um, and so sometimes it keeps increasing, sometimes it drops. Um, so, you know, we always kind of take it with a grain of salt. The main thing is you sort of see this trend, and then at the very end it might go up or down. But All right, I think we might uh, leave it there.